of Omar that assured the Christians of their freedom of worship and safety of their holy places. Caliph Omar went on to clean the barren space, and I would highlight barren space, of Al-Aqsa Mosque, Haram al-Sharif, and he established the first building within this sacred space. The inclusive care and custody that began with Omar al-Khattab is continued by the royal Hashemite family today. Today, the Hashemites' unconditional political, moral, and material support of the Christian and Muslim holy places in Jerusalem, including Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Sepulchre Church, continues to bring hope to a city that suffers from decades of occupation policies that undermine its religious and cultural character in flagrant violation of international law. This is in juxtaposition to the recent Israeli attempt to tax church property. It should be noted that the Quranic reference to the Al-Aqsa Mosque as a mosque took place years before the actual arrival of Muslims in Jerusalem. It means that part of what the, Muslim, what the Muslims believe is that Al-Aqsa Mosque was designated as a mosque by God. While not every waqf is a mosque, every mosque is a waqf, endowed in perpetuity. Al-Aqsa Mosque Haram al-Sharif is the name of the space that spans little more, a little more than 144 donums or 36 acres, with all structures above ground or subterranean, including the walls themselves, Bab al-Rahma, al-Marwani, Dome of the Rock, and the Qibli are but some of the structures that form Al-Aqsa Mosque Haram al-Sharif. All of them enjoy the same theological, juridical, and spiritual significance. Mujir al Hanbali, died 1522, wrote in his History of Jerusalem and Hebron, Al-Uns al-Jali fi Tariq al-Quds wal-Khalil, that Al-Aqsa Mosque is the name of the space. For all the buildings are novel. This definition reflects the belief and actual history of prayers in all parts of Al-Aqsa Mosque Haram al-Sharif. There has never been a speck of doubt in my mind about the equally meritorious prayers, whether I pray at the beautiful Dome of the Rock that continues to define Jerusalem aesthetically or directly on the earth under the olive trees that dot the land of Al-Aqsa Mosque Haram al-Sharif. When hundreds of thousands of Muslim worshippers pray at Al-Aqsa Mosque Haram al-Sharif during Ramadan, they literally form a wall-to-wall -wall carpet, human carpet, their prayers reflect a continuum of 1,400 years of this physical and spiritual bond. The lack of freedom of worship and the lack of freedom of movement, that is the need for permits issued by the, military, the Israeli military in the occupied Palestinian territories, violates this basic right for most Palestinians most of the year. During Easter, when they uh, reflect when the Israeli media speaks about how many permits were, were given to the Christians also during Easter for those who come from the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. It means that throughout the year they don't have that freedom. The Hashemites' role in the con conservation and maintenance of the aesthetical dimension, including the multi-year restoration project of Al-Aqsa Mosque mosaics, is essential in protecting Jerusalem's Arab Islamic cultural heritage. Just, just a, a, a footnote, literally it, it functions like a manuscript when you look at the Umayyad, uh, uh, the, the mosaics from the Umayyad period that have the uh, Quranic uh, chapters on the, uh, um, on the drum of the, uh, of the dome itself. And we do have, uh, I will make a reference to the uh, department that deals with the, with the manuscripts. While there is vested religious duty and moral obligation to do so, the Hashemites are in fact preserving heritage of a universal value. Unfortunately, Israel continues to violate the status quo, preventing many major projects from being Im implemented. Two weeks ago, I'm referring to the same story that Dr. Bernard Sabela referred to, Mr. Al-Hallaq, one of the residential engineers at Al-Aqsa Mosque, Haram al-Sharif, was detained and handcuffed for renovating one tile only. This is simply one of his many surreal encounters with the Israeli police, whose role as occupation authority is to be stationed outside the gates. They should not be able to interfere in the affairs and work of the Waqf Department, which is institutionally part of the Jordanian Ministry of Religious Affairs. It's a direct infringement of the, on the Waqf's uh, role. Mudir Dhajjin Hanbali again used Al-Masjid al-Sharif al-Aqsa in the first page of his introduction to Lunsil Jalil, 
But the order of the words differed in the chapter on the description of Al Aqsa Mosque. He used the Masjid Al Aqsa Sharif. Muslim scholars understood that the name Al Aqsa Mosque predates the structures and that no one building could be called as such. Uh, this is, again, Dr. Wasfi yesterday spoke about, uh, without mentioning that it was really uh, uh, Mr. Liberman who distributed the, uh, the um, A4, if you will, at the uh, diplomatic missions in, in Tel Aviv, trying to define Aqsa Mosque as the very last southern building uh, after Prime Minister Netanyahu committed uh, himself to, uh, to, the, to the status quo within 24 hours. The, his foreign minister really uh, went back on, uh, uh, on the word of the, uh, of the government. It's none of the business of Israel to define Al-Aqsa Mosque or the Sepulchre Church and, you know, this is really, uh, uh, it violates the interference of the state in such, uh, uh, in such an affair is uh, absolutely unacceptable. Al-Hambali called it Al-Jami' Al-Kabir Al-Qibli. If you talk about that building, the Grand Southern Friday Mosque, it is quite remarkable that Mujirdin Al-Hambali, in the year 900 uh, of the Islamic calendar, 1495, when there were no ideologically motivated alternative narratives regarding Al-Aqsa Mosque. He offered the following definition. Verily, Al-Aqsa is the name of the whole mosque which is surrounded by the wall. The length and width of which are mentioned here in the book. He, he measured, it, measured it twice, both the length and the width, for the building that exists in the southern part of the mosque. And the other ones, such as the Dome of the Rock and the corridors and other buildings, are novel, muhdatha. The paragraph that preceded the definition was dedicated to its measurement. Twice the measurements of Al-Aqsa Mosque were taken under the supervision of Al-Hambali to make sure that they were accurate. He mentioned that the length of the mosque was measured from the southern wall to the northern corridor near Bab al-Asbat and the width, that's Lion's Gate, and the width was measured from the wall overlooking the cemetery of Bab al-Rahma to the western corridor beneath the historical Tankazi school which was confiscated and is still used by the Israeli occupation forces. Despite the fact that all illegal Israeli measures are null and void under international law, both Bab al-Rahma and the adjacent cemetery suffer from the onslaught of occupation policies that aim at confiscating these Islamic religious sites. To capture the spirit of the Israeli institutional position regarding the religious space of the other, one can look at the Israeli municipality's decision, the Jerusalem municipality's decision, to grant permits to Rabbi Heyer from Los Angeles to build a museum of tolerance, tolerance nevertheless, on top of the Muslim cemetery of Mamela, Ma'manilla, very close to the northwestern corner of the old city. This led to exhuming human remains that filled 400 boxes, as reported by the Israeli media. The journey by night had Jerusalem as a transit station or as a gate to the heavens. God could have taken his prophet directly from Mecca to heaven, but he didn't. Al-Aqsa Mosque has a very prominent place in the whole event. It was the place where the prophet led the other prophets and messengers in prayer. This act is interpreted, among other things, as inheriting the responsibility and becoming custodians of the mosque, and hence the Hashemite custodianship of Al-Aqsa Mosque and also the uh, other Islamic and Christian uh, holy places. Again, it's not the business of any occupying authority to define the holy places of the occupied, nor it is the business of the occupying authority to interfere in the maintenance of these holy places. It is quite surreal to see a senior residential engineer uh, suffering time and again, once for a tile, another time for doing a paint job, and a third time for trying to replace uh, uh, a rusty uh, water pipe. A century of continuous Hashemite care of Al-Aqsa Mosque is violated by the Israeli occupation policies, contravening international law, universal conventions, and even the Wadi Arab Peace Treaty with Jordan, especially Article 9. The Hashemites, Jordan's royal family, and the whole Al-Aqsa Mosque are organically intertwined. No mention of Al-Aqsa Mosque is complete without acknowledging the historical role of Jordan a legacy that again began in 1924 when Jerusalemites asked Sharif 
Hussein bin Ali to renovate Al Aqsa Mosque. Help continues to flow ever since. Many major projects were carried out by the Hashemite kings, including four major renovations. Uh, the latest, basically, is uh, His uh, Majesty King Abdullah uh, II. The theological and spiritual relationship with Jerusalem uh, could only be uh, explained through a host. I have translated 27 prophetic traditions, uh, and they will be published, but there are also other, uh, other traditions. Al-Aqsa Mosque is the only mosque in the world from which basically you can initiate, as an example, the Umrah, the minor pilgrimage, uh, where it would be considered the equivalent in terms of merit to a full pilgrimage, to a full Hajj. This is not even granted to the mosque in, uh, in, in Medina in, Islamic, in the Islamic worldview. The Palestinian appreciation of the continued Hashemite custodianship was manifested officially in the March 30, 31st of the year 2013 in an agreement between His Majesty King Abdullah II Ibn al-Hussein, the custodian of the holy places in Jerusalem, and His Excellency Dr. Mahmoud Abbas, President of Palestine. He signed it in his capacity as President of Palestine and as Head of the Palestinian Liberation Organization and as President of the Palestinian National Authority. This reflects a very important uh, dimension in understanding the, the importance, the, not only the religious role of the Hashemite family, but understanding the essential political role that the Hashemites continue to play uh, even at, at international uh, fora in protecting uh, Jerusalem's heritage but directly in trying to attempt to protect Al-Aqsa uh, Mosque. Again, let's remember that the Waqf Department in Jerusalem is part of uh, the, uh, the Al-Aqsa Mosque. I would like to uh, end with uh, an Arabic proverb. Uh, a crazy person, if a crazy person drops a stone in a well, it takes 100, it's almost practically impossible for 100 sane people and intelligent people to get it out from the well. I would say it's even more difficult, even as we see it today, for uh, almost 180 sane uh, people, entities, states to take it out of that well. Let's stop dropping stones in that well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Abuswe. That uh, proverb it's, uh, could be used not just for, for this issue, but, but for, all, uh, for multilateralism, which is uh, under many threats right now. Uh, thank you for your insightful presentation. You have impressed uh, upon us the important role of the Hashemite Kingdom and, uh, uh, in the preservation of the holy sites in Jerusalem. We also appreciate uh, your personal dedication to the preservation in Jerusalem. Our third speaker is Ms. Lia uh, Shaktiel, I hope I'm pronouncing it very well, uh, who is representing the Israeli peace movement of Os Af Shalom. Os Shalom. Os Shalom. <laughs> Uh, rabbis for Human Rights and other Israeli NGOs committed to equality among Palestinians and Israelis and human rights. Ms. Shaktiel is not only a social activist but also the first woman to have become a member of a local religious council in Israel. She is based in uh, Yeruham, a small development town in the uh, uh, desert. Ms. Shaktiel will be speaking to us today about a Jewish perspective of the, on the holy sites in Jerusalem. Uh, Madam, you have the floor. Thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, I am here. Uh, good morning, everybody. I am here as a religious Orthodox Jew. To those of you who are familiar with the different fractions, 
uh, I hopefully, if I finish my test this summer, I will be ordained as an Orthodox rabbi. And uh, I'm a Zionist, born in Jerusalem, moved to the Negev Desert because I am opposed to the settler movement, even though three of our seven children are settlers and we don't give them a penny towards their houses. We give birthday presents, all kinds of things, but not for living in the settlements. I'm here to tell you that they, it is possible for Orthodox religious Israeli Judaism to accommodate not only peace but to accommodate the sovereignty of the Palestinian people alongside our sovereignty in some sort of political accommodation in the same land, which is the land of Israel, but also the land of Palestine. So I, I know that I look like a settler woman, but I'm here to tell you uh, a different, I'm here to bring a different message. I will begin by presenting the history of the, uh, very briefly, because I think that you are probably familiar with this, uh, the history of the Jewish connection to Jerusalem. Uh, and you will have, the, or you already have the full paper in, on the site, or, you know, you, it'll be available. Uh, it begins 3,000 years ago with King David, uh, whom I believe is considered a prophet by the Islam, Daoud, uh, who, he was the one who conquered that place from the Canaanites and made it into his capital because he was eager to create a new political seat for his new ki kingdom. He was the one who decided that this capital will also be the seat of the, uh, of the uh, religious center of the religion. He was the one who wanted to build a temple he was the one who was told by God that you are chosen as the permanent uh, lineage of dynasty of kings uh, of the, for the people of Israel and that your son will build the temple. Your son meaning King Solomon. Meaning that according to our narrative it was David who chose Jerusalem and it was God who chose David and affirmed his choice of Jerusalem. Uh, the Jewish connection to the temple which was eventually built there by Solomon then destroyed and the second temple was built and then the second temple was destroyed. The Jewish connection to that has never stopped and we have proof of that in every day uh, the, the blessing that we say after eating, the, the, uh, the prayers that we say three times a day uh, not to mention uh, the Sabbath and the holidays. Every Jew throughout history, uh, uh, every single day, was mentioning uh, not only the land of Israel, but also the city of Jerusalem, Zion, which was originally, the word Zion referred originally to a castle inside the city of Jerusalem, but became a metonym for the entire land, whereby in the early uh, 20th century somebody suggested it as a name for the renewal of our national aspirations for sovereignty. Zionism takes its name from Zion. Uh, let me just mention the Jews from Ethiopia. They call themselves Beta Israel as a people, but they also uh, were longing to come back to Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which for them was the land of Israel. Jerusalem was the metonym for the land of Israel. Uh, I will, uh, in that context, I want only to mention one thing which really shocked me a little bit, but maybe not. Last week I was in Montreal for another conference and I spent uh, the weekend with my cousins, uh, second cousins in Montreal, religious Jews, Zionist religious Jews, half their children already live in the land of Israel. Um, and I see in their home a little donation box, okay, that big, uh, with a slot in, on top to put the coins in. And that donation uh, box was shaped by a Jewish person, a Jewish man from Miami, Florida, it says so in the bottom, in the shape of the second temple. Unbelievable. So they have it on the table as a symbolic um, link that, the, that they have as Jews to the idea of the temple in Jerusalem. Okay, so I've, uh, I've said that in order to put it aside. 
given that we have this uh, very important connection to the Jerusalem and to the Jewish temple in Jerusalem, now what? You see? That's the question. Now what? I, and I know very well, and it has been talked about here, that there are groups of Jews, uh, extremist Jews, who uh, actually would like to see the Dome of the Rock destroyed. I, I want to say it really, out loud. They would like to see that destroyed. They would like to see it replaced by a temple, a Jewish temple. With, and they would like to renew the uh, sacrifice of animals there, for crying out loud. Okay, we know that. The problem is that the majority of the Jews in Israel don't uh, have the political guts to actually uh, send those Jews where they belong to the marginal, uh, to the margin. They don't have the political guts to do it. So the, the, uh, this uh, ideology, this perspective, seems to have uh, a, a uh, hold on the mentality of the right-wing government of Israel, which is not... It is my government, it's the government of my country, okay? But I never voted for it, okay? I, I can only express my, my um, uh, um, discontent with the fact that they didn't bother to come here uh, to this room and present uh, uh, their, uh, we are a member of the United Nations, aren't we? Why shouldn't Israel be here? They chose not to. And I can, I, I'm, I don't like that. But uh, I'm not here to represent the government of Israel. I'm here to tell you that uh, there are religious Jews in Israel who feel that the fact that the right-wing government gives these right-wing extremists their political uh, support, I think, is disastrous. Our understanding of the Zionist project is according to, and it was also quoted in this room, is according to understanding that it must respect the, the return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel must respect the rights of all religions and, and must respect all holy places. I think that the uh, Dome of the Rock is the most beautiful building in the world. I really do. And I think that, it, uh, that we, uh, that there are religious Jews like myself who think that there's absolutely no problem with that uh, continuing to represent the worship of all humankind to the one God, Allah, which is also our God, which is also the same God that the Christians worship. We all worship the same God. There's absolutely no uh, uh, reason why it shouldn't continue to be so. Uh, I think that it is uh, possible, and they have been already submitted by various uh, peace-oriented organizations, various uh, uh, detailed um, plans how to uh, take the holy basin of Jerusalem, which includes the old city, but not only. How to take that, how to look from the point of view of urban planning, okay? From the point of view of urban planning, how to take that holy basin and create in it a livable situation for all three uh, uh, major religions, and uh, meaning that uh, not only the major three uh, places, the Dom, uh, the Haram el Sharif, and uh, whatever the Jews will do, Western Wall, not Western Wall, I, I don't care. It could be something in the Jewish quarter, wherever. And the, I don't, uh, I think that the correct name for it is not the Church of the Sepulcher, but the Church of Revival, isn't it? Uh, and uh, take all of that area, which includes also other places of worship for, of all three religions. There are many other mosques, there are many other churches, there are many other synagogues. That, all of that can be taken into account and we can create a, a space in which all three religions have a central place of worship. They can visit with each other. They can also create some sort of a space where we all can convene and share our universal feelings of spirituality and unity and uh, coexistence. And this is very important to add that. Uh, it, it will be completely wrong to think only in terms of theology and philosophy. We are here to say that all of that has to be taken to the reality on the ground of real people living there, real Jews and real Palestinians. None of this can be based 
on the destruction of people's homes, on the uh, uh, expulsion of people from their homes. None of this can be based on, on the undermining of, of buildings of, of each other's religion. None of this can be based on the, uh, uh, on the um, using the law in a ruthful way in order to give uh, power to one religion over another. None of this can, can be done in this way or, or changing the landscape in a way that will bring out one side and uh, at the expense of the other side. In that sense, I think that what the, um, uh, the Israeli government, the government of my own uh, <laughs> people, the Israeli government has done uh, and is continuing to be doing uh, things that are totally unjust and that I am proud to say that I've been part of the opposition, not very successfully, obviously, but I've been part of the opposition to this type of policies ever since I remember myself, uh, ever since I came of age, which is like 50 years ago, and uh, which is why I went to live in the Negev Desert in the first place and am involved with social justice issues with our Nebuin, Bedouin neighbors in the south also. I think that it is possible to take the sources of our religion and move away from the sacrifice of animals in the uh, old uh, temple by the same token that we can move away from the sacrifice of animals we can also move away from the particularistic chauvinistic sense that if you have uh, a place of worship for your own religion it becomes exclusive and sometimes oppressive of the other religions. We can move away from that. I think that King Solomon, in the Bible, in his prayer, upon the inauguration of the first, uh, of the first uh, temple, in his prayer, he already made reference to, to that. And I, I, uh, I love it when he said that, this is silly. I mean, you, God, are infinite. You cannot, do, you know, what, it, what does it mean that you dwell in this place? You dwell in this place only in a very symbolic way. The fact is that the entire universe cannot contain you because you contain the universe. You are so big. So what does it mean that you dwell here? You only dwell here in order to make it possible for us humans to be closer to you and pray for you. It, it's not just me, King Solomon. It's not just the people of Israel that we hope you will listen to even when we are uh, taken away from this land uh, and punished for our sins. Uh, you will help us to come back. It's not only that. It's for every human being who prays to you from this place. You will hear that prayer. In other words, right from the start, the Jewish idea of a focal point of worship in the city of Jerusalem is actually, it stands there for a very universal idea of human relationship with God, spirituality. I am absolutely convinced that this can be done in our day and age. I hope we will all live to see this, a peace and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation, Ms. Chardiel. It is very uh, valuable to understand the perspectives and sensitivities of the different worshippers to whom Jerusalem is, is holy. Uh, I think it's time for us to take a, 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 to have a break. So we'll, we'll resume our session in uh, 15 minutes, please. Oh, sorry. No, no. Uh, uh, then we'll have our next speaker. And uh, we will continue with Thank questions you, and comments. Thank you. Okay? Thank Just uh, 10, 15 minutes to, for a cup of coffee. Thank you,
Excellencies, distinguished experts, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to the second day of our conference. Excellencies, the third panel under the theme Jerusalem, holy to the three monotheistic religions. I'd like to point out that this panel is hosting speakers from the three monotheistic faiths who agreed to share their perspectives on the equal access of, of all faiths to the holy sites of Jerusalem. I'd like to thank them for coming all the way from Jerusalem and the United States to Geneva and welcome them, uh, them to today's uh, session. I would also like to thank the uh, women representatives from the Young Christian Women Association and Kairos Palestine who also join us for this. We have heard the last speaker for this item. The General Assembly has thus concluded the, this stage of its consideration of sub-item B of Agenda Item 74. The General Assembly will resume its consideration of Agenda Item 168 entitled The Responsibility to Protect and the Prevention of Genocide, War Crimes, Ethnic Cleansing, and crimes against humanity. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of South Africa. Mr. President, my delegation would like to thank you for convening this meeting. We would like to welcome Ms. Karen Smith on her appointment as the advisor to the Secretary General on the responsibility to protect, and wish her all the success in her new role. We further thank Mr. Adama Dieng, the Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide, for the important role his office continues to play. Mr. President, we also welcome the report of the Secretary General on the responsibility to protect. We will further like to highlight the following five points in our statement. The importance of prevention, the role of regional organization, women peace and security agenda, protection of civilians, and the importance of guarantees of non-recurrence. Mr. President, firstly, on prevention, South Africa strongly agrees that the prevention of atrocities is central to the successful implementation of R2P. We therefore continue to advocate for a greater focus on the wide range of tools available to us with regard to enhanced diplomacy and multilateralism. R2P must, as is the central interest, promote the safety and well-being of the affected populations and should never be used to advance the narrow self-interest of those who seek intervention. Therefore, any Security Council mandate imposing R2P must be clearly defined and implemented in a letter and in the spirit of the, its provision. Most importantly, it must respect the charter of this organization. The 2005 World Summit outcome document states that the application of responsibility to protect is strictly limited to genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. The application of the concept should, as such, be narrow and restricted to the above mentioned four identified crimes, utilizing all tools and conflict prevention and resolution available to the United Nations. Mr. President, based on South Africa's experiences of UN Security Council Resolution 1973 on Libya, and 1975 on Côte d'Ivoire, we are opposed to any open-ended authorization of use of force with no accountability, which has led to regime change expeditions. Domestic interference in the internal affairs of member states should not be disguised 
as applying the principles of the responsibility to protect. When this principle is abused, it can lead to catastrophic consequences that can result in the displacement of people, unprecedented migration, and other humanitarian challenges. As the Secretary General report states, the need to strengthen the rule of law for atrocity prevention is important. The report further calls for action in three main areas, which are access to justice, effective and legitimate security forces, and transparent and accountable governance. We believe accountability is vital in terms of justice for victims and the fight against impunity. However, accountability should never be a substitute for genuine prevention efforts. Furthermore, South Africa, as the co-chair of the Group of Friends on Security Sector Reform, will continue to use that platform to promote and prioritize negotiations, the use of good offices, mediation, arbitration, and other peaceful means to address any challenges faced by countries affected by conflict. Mr. President, secondly, the role of regional organization in conflict prevention cannot be overemphasized. Article 4 of the Constitutive Act of the African Union established the right of the AU to intervene in a member state to prevent grave violations of human rights. However, this should only be activated once all other efforts in mediating the conflict have been exhausted. It is broadly agreed that the principle of prevention is more effective than the use of force in reacting to conflict. And in this regard, the African Union Commission has operationalized the AU Mediation Support Unit, MSU, in mid-March 2019. The EU Commission has devoted efforts towards the strengthening of the MSU, including through capacity building on mediation, as well as the mainstreaming of gender and mediation. This has strengthened the AU capacity to address conflict in the continent in order to avoid costly interventions, which often lead to the loss of life. The international community should assist the capacity of member states and regional organization in addressing the conflict hotspots through mediation before activating the principle of the responsibility to protect. In this regard, we agree with the Secretary General's report to provide support to national authorities in strengthening their capacity to prevent atrocity crimes. Thirdly, women, peace, and security agenda. As the 20th, 20th anniversary of the Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security approaches, we continue to call for women's full participation in political and economic systems to help in addressing the root causes of conflict. Women's perspective and experience are important for early warning that can prevent conflict and its resurgence. As the Secretary General's report points out, women's economic empowerment also constitutes a contributing positive element to secure livelihoods and that there is a need to further connect the atrocity prevention agenda with other global commitments and priorities, including Agenda 2030, especially Sustainable Development Goal 16, Women, Peace and Security, as well as International Peace and Security. Mr. President, fourthly, on the protection of civilians. It is important for the UN to periodically evaluate its response to the protection of civilians because the protection of civilians from the scourge of conflicts is at the core of maintaining international peace and security. If the UN is not seen to be protecting civilians and if innocent children, women, and men continue to suffer on our watch, we will have thus failed the mandate instructed, instructed to us. South Africa is as such fully committed to the protection of civilians in armed conflict and continue to support the strengthened normative and legal framework of enhancing such protection. Moreover, the Security Council will do well to consider the advice by the Secretary General that preventive action is built on A, trust, B, transparency, C, accountability. The Security Council should therefore reconsider the manner in which it executes its mandate and address threats to and breaches to international peace and security. Furthermore, 
It should increase its engagement with member states, especially those affected by conflict, and are upon to effective engagement with regional and sub-regional organizations. Most UN peacekeeping missions include the protection of civilians mandate, and this should be strengthened to ensure that conflict-related sexual violence and activities in support of the disarmament and demobilization of armed groups is addressed. We wish to underline that it remains the primary responsibility of states to protect civilians within their borders. Armed opposition groups also bear responsibility of ensuring that unarmed civilians are protected and the failure by both state and non-state actors to uphold the principle should not go unpunished. Accountability must first and foremost be sought at the national <coughs> level. Failing that, international community has a collective responsibility to act in accordance with international humanitarian law, using mechanism at its disposal, including independent fact-finding commission and commissions of inquiry. Fifth, importance of guarantee of non-recurrence. It is important to ensure that those countries that have experienced such atrocities never experience them again. National accountability efforts are also important and among the most effective ways of preventing recurrence of atrocity crimes, as highlighted in the Secretary General's report. Guarantees of non-recurrence of mass atrocity crimes are embedded within the United Nations Resolution and Declaration on peace building and sustainable development, particularly SDG 16, linking social integration, justice, and sustainable peace. It is important to ensure that we address the economic inequalities, which are often the cause of social tensions when certain groups in society feel marginalized. Mr. President, in conclusion, South Africa reaffirmed its full support for the mandate of Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide and on the responsibility to protect and encourage member states to do the same. I thank you. I thank the Distinguished Representative of South Africa, and I give the floor to the Distinguished Representative of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Mr. President, let me begin by reaffirming Iran's unwavering commitment to the noble goal of the protection of civilian and prevention of atrocity crimes. We are party to the 1948 Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide and fully respect our obligations arising from this convention, namely the duty to prevent and the duty to punish crime of genocide. We have also expressed on previous occasions our understanding from the responsibility to protect as enshrined in the 2005 summit outcome document. Here I would like to underline a few points. The primary responsibility to, pre to prevent commission of genocide war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity lie with sovereign states. Other states or the international community at large may step in to help open requests on a case-by-case -case basis and through the United Nations to prevent such horrendous atrocities. In limited cases where the use of force is required to save the population the R2P falls within the collective security framework of the United Nations and can only be authorized by the Security Council in full compliance with international law and only as a last resort. We also took note of some recommendations to further develop, conceptualize, or operationalize the R2P concept. However, it is premature to discuss these recommendations since still we are far from a consensual understanding of the R2P. 
At the same time, it seems that there are some attempts to introduce alternatives for the UN central role in this process, such as putting forward the concept of international leadership of a state or group of states to provide preventive action. Such recommendations give rise to serious concerns to many countries and could be easily manipulated, particularly in a time that the R2P has failed the test for objectivity as well as impartiality and is guided by the politicized interest of certain states rather than human dignity and human rights and therefore has been taken far from its alleged objective and purposes. In this regard, we reiterate our call that prior to implementation of the R2P, it is crucial to define its normative content and objectives as well as its scope of applications. The effort in this regard should be consistent with the UN Charter and well-established principles of international law. Prevention of mass atrocities crime, crimes should remain the core objective of the R2P. This by no means whatsoever may imply permit to use force against another state under any pretext such as humanitarian intervention, which may pave the way for all manners of politically motivated interventions in other countries. The objectives of R2P should not be defined as regime change or interference in the internal affairs of the countries. Prevention should be seen as a long-term strategy and be interpreted in broad terms and mainly include non-coercive measures. In this context, the R2P should be seen as a framework to address the root causes of the conflict and assist the vulnerable and failed states to develop their capacity to protect their population and build safer society. Prevention involves a broad range of issues from promotion of sustainable development, education, and health to eradication of poverty, marginalization, and discrimination. Beside the, if, besides the efforts for increasing resilience of societies by addressing root causes of conflict through capacity building, member states should stop selling arms to the volatile regions. The conduct of the arm exporters of the R2P proponent raises profound skepticism on their seriousness and honesty concerning the noble objective of protection of civilians. The question arises as to how these countries fulfill their obligations vis-a-vis -vis the protection of the population while simultaneously selling arms with the prior knowledge or experience that those arms will eventually end up being used to target innocent civilians and will ultimately lead to war crimes and crimes against humanity. It is unfortunate that civilian population have been attacked in recent years, either in their homes, schools, hospitals, and even in public ceremonies such as funeral or wedding. The devastating experience of the past decades in the Middle East and Africa, which have highly contributed to the regeneration and expansion of terrorism and extremism in affected countries and the world as a whole exposes the consequences of irresponsible protections. The irrespons irresponsible military interventions have created a breeding ground for these menaces to thrive. Last but not least, the only way to restore the R2P and its legitimacy is to end that selectivity and double standard as well as genuinely 
address the plight of mankind whenever they face atrocity crimes in full conformity with the principles and objectives of the UN Charter. We should draw lessons from tragic and horrible Rwanda genocide, define humanity and human dignity as the only driver of the R2P and put aside political interests and political considerations. Addressing the misery of people under foreign occupation is the most immediate test for the R2P. In conclusion, Mr. President, notwithstanding